the messages that I uh, will be preaching, and uh, tonight we will be in all of chapter 1. Now, those of you who were in the morning service yesterday here know that I spoke from the first 18 verses. Obviously, if it's expositional, some of it is going to have to be the same, but not necessarily a duplication. The key to the book of John is found in chapter 20. The last two verses, John chapter 20, many other signs truly Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So why are these written? These are written. These signs are written that you might believe. Believe is a key idea in the Gospel of John. It occurs only as a verb and more than 90 times in this gospel. It has different meanings. We're not going to preach from chapter 8 tonight, but I would draw your attention to the fact in chapter 8, because chapter 8 is on our list, That in chapter 8, verse 30, as he, Jesus, spake these words, many believed on him. You would think that means that they were trusting him. Notice the next verse. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. These people did not know the truth. The truth had not yet set them free. And they responded in verse 33, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? And in verse 34, Jesus responds, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant or the slave of sin. The servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. They were interested in listening to and maybe even intellectually agreeing with certain ideas of Jesus, but they were not yet trusting in him. And John says, I'm writing these miracles, these signs, so that you might believe, that you might have saving faith, that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God. And it's very clear from the verses we just read that these Jewish people did not believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, or the Son of God. Because true saving faith leads to eternal life, that believing you might have life through his name, by his authority. The point is, the Gospel of John emphasizes the signs, the miracles. They emphasize what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. It emphasizes the content of that faith, that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and title Son of God speaks of his deity, not his humanity. And that believing you might have life through his name and eternal life is described in the Gospel of John as both a present possession and an eternal relationship. One that begins the minute you put your trust in Jesus Christ and physical death cannot terminate that. Nothing can terminate it. I give unto them, chapter 10, eternal life and they shall almost never no, oh, they shall never perish. Isn't that wonderful? No one's able to pluck us out of the Father's hand because we already possess eternal life. It's true that we have to trust. 
it's more than just believing in the sense of intellectual understanding and agreement. It is personal trust. But the object of our trust has to be a worthy one. If you look at a chair and, and you like its construction and you decide to sit down, either it holds you or it doesn't. And if it doesn't hold you, if it collapses under you, then it's an unworthy object of your trust. Jesus will always be uh, a, an object worthy of your trust. Not only for salvation, but for everyday Christian living, whatever your needs may be. You can trust him. Why? Because in John chapter 1, I've got four major points. Because Jesus, first of all, is God's word. The first 13 verses. He is God's word. And you can see, at least I have found in these first 13 verses... Five, for lack of a better term, five periods of time. Can you have a period of time before time? Well, no, you can't. But for the sake of what we're trying to say, that'll be point number one. Before creation. So we're identifying a when. But verses one and two talk about the word, the word of God before creation. Take the phrase in verse 1, in the beginning, and say, this is creation. It's true that literally it reads, in beginning. The the isn't there. That doesn't mean it's not definite, however, because even in Genesis 1.1, the the doesn't happen to be there. And yet, very clearly, when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, he has a specific point in time in mind, the creation. And here you've got in the beginning was existing already the imperfect tense. The word was already existing in the beginning before creation. And this tells us that he himself is uncreated. He has no beginning. In any beginning you want to name, he was already there. Secondly, verse 1 says, the word was with, literally toward, the God. The God is a particular member of the Godhead, God the Father. And the word is not just impersonal reason or logic. The word is towards, his face is towards the God, and they are talking with one another. They are in fellowship with one another. The word is a person. The word is eternal. In the beginning was the word. The word is personal. The word was with God. And the word was sharing the divine nature. What makes God the Father God is shared by his Son, the eternal word, the eternal Son of God. He exists before creation. Verse 2 says the same was in the beginning with God. Sort of a summary statement. Verses 3 and 4 say not only before creation, but at creation. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That's pretty detailed. Pretty clear. Unless you want to deny it, of course. I'll let you in on a profound philosophical concept. You can't create unless you exist. You can't bring yourself into existence. It doesn't say all other things were made by him. It says all things were made by him, which means he already existed. Things that have a beginning, he is the one who brought them into existence. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, underived life. No one ever gave it to him. He's always possessed it. And his life was the light of men. 
the light is given to us through the life of the eternal word. And this is explained in two ways. First, in verse 5, you've got the third point in time. First, before creation, verses 1 and 2. Then at creation, 3 and 4. And then after the fall into sin by Adam and Eve. The minute Adam and Eve disobeyed God, there's the conflict between light and darkness. Good and evil. God and the devil. And we're told the light shines in darkness and the darkness comprehended or apprehended it not. The darkness wasn't able to snuff out the light. Light and darkness are opposites. And so throughout human history, from the time Adam and Eve disobeyed God until a certain point in time, that conflict goes on. Then there's the fourth stage or period of time, verses 6 through 10. At his earthly ministry, Jesus, without ceasing to be divine, becomes a human being and as an adult has an earthly ministry. And so verse 6 says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, not John, but Jesus was the true light, which gives light to every man. And while that may be true from the beginning of human history, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, God did not leave the human race without a certain amount of light. That light changed radically brighter when Jesus appeared on earth. And that's why verses, verse 10 can say he was in the world. The world was made by him and the world knew him not. Before creation, at creation, after the fall, at his earthly ministry, and now today, verses 12 and 13. His own received him not, but as many as received him, as many as were willing to put their trust in him. To them he gave power. There are different words translated power in our English Bible. Some emphasize the powerfulness of power. Acts 1.8, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. But that isn't this word. This is the word which means authority or right. He gave the right to become the children of God. Interestingly, though our English Bible sometimes says sons of God, in the Gospel of John and in 1 John, the Greek text, all of the Greek texts, no matter which one you're looking at, say children of God. Isn't that interesting? Now, it's not unscriptural to call us sons of God. Paul does that in Romans 8. But John wants to make a point. You become a child of God through receiving Christ by believing in his name. But for John's purpose, God has only one son. He is the only begotten son of God. And only begotten doesn't refer simply to uniqueness. There's a big debate going on. And the, what used to be the traditional view, the view that I'm giving you, is now a very minority view. The Greek word, mano genes, what does the genes come from? Mano is only, what does genes come from? The verb to beget, genao, or the word genos, which they say means kind, one of a kind, unique. And I'm saying that is a non-issue. When you look up the number of times that genos is used in the New Testament, about 21 times, at least 11 of them, more than half of them, emphasize a family relationship. 
Revelation 22, 16, Jesus says, I am the root and the offspring. There's genos. I am the root and the offspring of David. So whether monogenes comes from genos or genao makes no difference. Only begotten is a perfectly correct translation. John wants to say that title is reserved for the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to promote, he wants to focus our attention on Jesus. We become, we have the right to become children of God by putting our trust in him, by believing on his name, by his authority, for his name's sake. 1 John 2, 12, your little children, your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. He made a promise. John 3, 16 gives the promise. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, anyone who believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I have put my trust in him. God's reputation, God's name is now at stake. And 1 John 2.12 says our sins are forgiven for his name's sake. And we are born... Not of blood, not of biological descent. We're not Christians because our parents were. We're not born because of the will of the flesh. Well, I can, I can trust Christ anytime I want to. I've got plenty of time. I'll wait a while. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You have no guarantee of tomorrow. And who are born... Not of the will of man, no rabbi, no priest, no minister can perform some religious ritual over you and pronounce you a child of God. Only God is able to cause you to become a child of God. That's what verse 13 says. And that happens, verse 12 says, when you believe in him by receiving him, trusting him. It's a personalizing of the message God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that anyone who believes in, who trusts in him. But it's not just, I believe Jesus died for sinners. It's, I'm the sinner who needs a savior. I put my trust in him to wash away my sins. Why should you trust them? Because he's God's word. Secondly, because he's God's only begotten son. Verses 14 through 18. The word was made flesh without ceasing to be divine. Remember verse 1, the word was God. The word was made flesh. It's not two little people living inside the same body. Jesus as a person... A divine person has always existed because he's possessed a divine nature. When Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, became human, the hu a human nature was welded onto that divine nature. So that in Acts 3.15, Peter can say to those Jews in Jerusalem, you killed the prince of life. Think of it. You killed the prince of life. Acts 3.15. Or Paul can say in 1 Corinthians 2.8, if the rulers of this world had known the plan of God, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. How can you crucify the Lord of glory? Only if the person you're crucifying is at the same time human and divine. This was brought home to me personally years ago in chatting with a minister from the United Pentecostal Church. The United Pentecostal Church doesn't believe in the Trinity. They argue, they say, they propagandize that Jesus is the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they baptize in the name of Jesus. And they think you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus in order to have your sins forgiven. So I said, honestly, without arguing, I would be interested to know 
what you think was happening when Jesus was praying to his heavenly father. He said it was his human nature praying to his divine nature. Now see, you've got two little people living inside the same body and the only kind of union is like two roommates. Hey, I've got my space, you've got yours. As long as we honor that, we'll get along fine. I didn't argue with them, but I asked one more question. I said, when Jesus hung on the cross, he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What does that mean? He said, God left the body of Jesus and Jesus died as a man. Think of it. This is a minister of a group that says Jesus is the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is God. This is our big promotional thing. And now he's saying Jesus died on the cross merely as a man. Incredible. And Paul says, no, they crucified the Lord of glory. And Peter says, no, they killed the Prince of Life because he is one person that possesses two natures which are welded together. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. His glory is not a manifestation of his humanity. It's a manifestation of his deity. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. There's that term again, only begotten of the Father. Jesus is God's only begotten Son. It's a title of deity. It emphasizes his glory. And verse 14 also says, full of grace and truth. Who is a pardoning God like thee, we sing. Wonderful song, wonderful testimony to this. Jesus possesses fullness of grace. Now, grace in the Bible can mean a number of different things. But one of the things it means describes is the person of Jesus Christ himself. So in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, we read, the grace of God which bringeth salvation has appeared. Boing! Has appeared. It's an event. Two verses later, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. But in verse 11, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Second Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. He talks about how we ought to be generous in our giving. And he says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that though he was rich... Yet he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. Jesus is God's grace. And, and when we say we believe we're saved by grace alone, we are also saying, whether we realize it or not, we are saved by Jesus Christ alone. His death, his resurrection was for us. Full of grace and truth. Now, as God's only begotten son, we see John the Baptist testifying to this in verse 15. John the Baptist had begun his ministry before Jesus came on the scene to begin his ministry. And John bore witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake, he that cometh after me. In his humanity, he is slightly younger than I am. All you have to do is go back to the Gospel of Luke, the end of chapter 1, after the angel comes to Mary and says, I've got good news, you're going to have a child. And she's saying, all right, let it be so. But then she's thinking, who's going to believe me? 
Who might possibly believe me? Oh, wait, there's my cousin Elizabeth. She doesn't have a, a virgin birth, but she has a miraculous birth because she's with child and she's too old to have a child. It's a miracle. If anyone would believe me, it's her. And of course, she, Elizabeth was to give birth to John the baptizer. He that cometh after me, Jesus was born after John, is preferred, verse 15, before me. Why? For he was before me. His birth in Bethlehem is not the beginning of his existence. He has always existed as a member of the Godhead. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. And verse 16, of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace, grace upon grace. God's grace is not limited. It's unlimited to those who put their trust in Jesus Christ. And in verse 17, law was given by Moses. Was the law given by Moses as a way of salvation? Absolutely not. Abraham, according to Romans 4, 2, was justified through faith. Law as guide for living came by Moses. Grace and truth as guidelines for Christian living come by Jesus Christ. It's true that grace and truth for salvation also come by Jesus Christ. But with the death and resurrection and ascension of Christ into heaven and the coming of the Holy Spirit, a new guideline, a new way of living, not previously possible because the means of godliness were for the most part external in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit lives within every believer. John 7. Jesus says in verses 37, 38, and 39, He that comes to me out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the Spirit, which they that believe in him should receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. <laughs> And then, verse 18, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son. Some Greek texts say the only begotten God. That's not unscriptural. We know from verse 1, the word was God. But here our text says he's the only begotten Son, and furthermore, He's in the bosom of the Father. So three times He emphasizes the Sonship, the eternal Sonship. Notice the verb in verse 18. The only begotten Son which is, present tense, is in the bosom of the Father. He always has been and always will be in the most intimate, close relationship to God the Father that's possible. This one has, past tense, aorist, has declared him. Have you ever heard the verb exegesis? That's the noun form, the verb to exegete a passage. If you eisegete the passage, you're misinterpreting it. You are leading into the ice or aces into. But if you're leading out of the passage, exegesis, you're leading out of the passage what is already there. You're explaining it. That's this word right here. He has declared him. You want to have an exegesis of God the Father? Then look at the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the declaration of God the Father. Why can you trust Him? He's God's Word, verses 1 through 13. Why can you trust Him? He's God's only begotten Son, verses 14 through 18. Why can you trust Him? Because in verses 19 through 31, He's God's sacrifice. 
John makes clear he's not the one. He is not the Christ, verse 20. Are you Elijah? No. Are you the, the prophet of Deuteronomy? No. Who are you? I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as says the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah in chapter 40 in verse 3. He was the forerunner to the king. And both John and Jesus offered an earthly kingdom to the nation Israel. An offer which they rejected. As verse 11 says, he came into his own and his own received him not. Well then, verse 29, the next day, John sees Jesus coming to him and says, Behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God was the animal of sacrifice. Behold, God's animal sacrifice. What did animal sacrifices do in the Old Testament? They covered sin. That's what the word atone means, to cover. Atonement, a covering. Leviticus 16, verse 30, the Day of Atonement chapter. On that day, the priest shall make an atonement, a covering for you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. How good was that covering for sin? Well, have you ever written a check for some things at the store? You go to the checkout counter, you hand them a check. They don't push a hidden button and the security guards come rushing out and take you away, or at least I hope that doesn't happen. Can you buy the merchandise with a check? Yes. How valuable is your check? Well, it depends on how much money you have in your checking account. Animal sacrifices could bring forgiveness of sins and cleansing like a check. They depended for their value on Jesus coming and dying as God's sacrifice. And verse 29 of John 1 says, He not merely covers sins, He takes them away. And not just for the nation Israel, but for anyone and everyone. And so in Hebrews 10, we read in verse 4, It's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. So Christ came to offer His body... By the will of God, I come to do your will of God. And in verse 10, he says, By the which will, the will of God, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We don't have an altar in the front or in the back here. The minister is not a priest offering a sacrifice. In the communion service, remembrance is made of a sacrifice that had been made and completed hundreds of years ago, the once-for-all death of Jesus Christ. We proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Jesus is God's Lamb who takes away, by his death on the cross as a sacrifice, takes away the sin of the world. Romans 3 has an interesting commentary on the animal sacrifices and the death of Jesus Christ in Romans 3, starting in verse 24, it says, being justified, being declared righteous in the sight of God. That's a change in his records. Being justified freely, which means it's unearned. By his grace means it's undeserved. Through the redemption, the paying of the ransom price that sets us free in Christ Jesus. The paying of the ransom price isn't talking about Jesus during his earthly ministry, walking and talking. It's talking about Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. In the communion service, the bread does not represent the physical body of Jesus as he walked and talked and taught. It represents the wounded body of Jesus Christ on the cross. 
The liquid in the cup does not represent the blood of Jesus Christ as it coursed through his veins. It represents his blood as it was shed for us on the cross of Calvary. So verse 24, being declared righteous freely, we don't earn it, by his grace we don't deserve it, through the paying of the ransom price that sets us free in Christ Jesus, that's his death on the cross, verse 25, whom God set forth to be a propitiation. Now difficult as that word may be, it is a wonderful, wonderful word. A propitiation is a wrath removing sacrifice a wrath removing sacrifice jesus dying on the cross was god sending him forth to be a wrath removing sacrifice through faith in his blood it's not faith in our faith someone comes forward to become a member of the church what are you trusting in? Well, I walked down an aisle. I prayed a prayer. I raised that. Those are all fine things, but don't trust in your trust. You have to have an object worthy of your trust. And that is only the Lord Jesus Christ who died for you and rose again. So he says, through faith in his blood, notice to declare his, God the Father's righteousness. God, by displaying Jesus publicly, dying on the cross, declares God the Father's righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. It's not talking about your past sins. It's talking about the sins that were committed before the cross of Calvary. The sins that had been covered by those animal sacrifices. Was God righteous when he forgave those sins, even though they were still there, but they were covered? He's saying here in verse 25, yes, the death of Jesus Christ by taking away those sins demonstrates that God was righteous in the remission of the sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Furthermore, verse 26 of Romans 3, the death of Christ declares, I say it this time, God's righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. If you want God to be just, but you're not willing to put your trust in Christ for salvation, then the only way God can express that justice is the lake of fire. And sometimes as a believer, when you say, God, whatever is happening in my life doesn't seem fair. Remember, if God were to say, oh, you want fair? <laughs> well, no, now that I've thought about it a little bit, I guess I don't. Put your trust in Jesus. He is God's sacrifice. He's, again, verse 30 repeats what verse 15 said. After me comes a man, that's his humanity, John says, which is preferred before me, for he was before me, speaks of his deity. And then John is a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ in verses 33 and 34 at his baptism he saw the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus and God had made it clear to him the end of verse 33 that the one who was to receive the Spirit that's the Lord Jesus would be the one who would give the Spirit once the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and that is what he does when we put our trust in him. And so John bears record that he's the son of God. Well, in verses 35 to the end of the chapter, Jesus is God's latter, L-A-D-D-E-R. We're not talking about latter day saints here. We're talking about Jesus is God's latter. You say, what an odd thing to say. Well, it is an odd thing to say. But you notice in verse 35, John the baptizer stood. There's two of his disciples with him. And he points to Jesus and he says, behold, the Lamb of God, which he had said in verse 29. Well, the disciples heard John speak and they decided to follow Jesus. And Jesus asks them, what seek ye? And they say, Rabbi or Master or Teacher, where dwellest thou? And he says, come and see. 
So they stayed. One of them was John, verse 40. The other was Andrew, the brother of Peter. And Andrew went, verse 41, and found his own brother, Peter, and said to him, We have found the Messiah. Messiah is the Hebrew word for anointed one. The Greek word is Christ. It means anointed one. We have found the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. The one that the Old Testament talked about. Who would be both human and divine. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, but his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. And they brought Peter to Jesus. And when Jesus saw him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas or stone, a rock. The next day, Jesus intended to go into Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip finds Nathanael and says to Nathanael, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. The anointed one predicted in the Hebrew scriptures. Jesus. Now think of the worst possible town that has the worst reputation and call it Nazareth because that's what it was. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? He's very skeptical. And Philip doesn't say, here are 25 historical evidences why you should believe. No, he says, come and see. Now, I want, before I go further, to draw your attention to something in Genesis 28. I know it sounds odd, and I want to, within five minutes, fly the airplane safely into the airport here, so to speak, bring it to a close without a crash landing. Here you have, in verse 1 of Genesis 28, God call, uh, uh, Isaac calls his son Jacob and says, don't take a wife from the daughters of Canaan, but go back to the house of Bethel, to your mother's fathers, and get a wife from there. And verse 3, God Almighty, may God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee that thou mayest be a multitude of people and give to thee the blessing that he had promised to Abraham to thee and thy seed with thee that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger which God gives uh, gave to Abraham. So he goes. And as he goes, verse 11, he lighteth upon a certain place, tarried there all night because the sun was set. He took stones out of that place and put them as a, a pillow and laid down in that place to go to sleep. And he dreams. And what does he dream? There's a ladder set up on the earth. And the top of the ladder reached to heaven. And what does he see? Angels of God ascending and descending upon that ladder. I think Nathaniel had been meditating on this passage because God makes a promise to Jacob through that dream of a ladder with the angels ascending and descending. He says in verses 13 and 14, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac, the land wherein thou liest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and in thee, and in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God has not yet fulfilled that promise finally and ultimately. But he also makes another promise. To Jacob about the present time. Behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land for I will not leave thee until I have done all that which I have spoken 
of thee. The promise of present help. Help for the sweet by and by, verses 13 and 14, but help for the nasty now and now in verse 15. And here in John chapter 1, verse 47, Nathanael, Jesus saw Nathanael coming and he says, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile, no deceit. Now listen, you have to know a person before you can give them that kind of a compliment. Otherwise, it's pure flattery. And so, Nick, uh, so Nathaniel says, Whence knowest thou me? How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. He doesn't tell us what it is that he saw about Nathaniel, but notice the response that's produced in Nathaniel. Nathaniel answered and said unto him, verse 49, Rabbi, Thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. You're going to be the one through whom this promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is fulfilled. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Lord Jesus is that ladder. He guarantees the future promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he also guarantees the promise made to you and to me that he won't leave us, that he won't forsake us. That whatever problems we are facing in our lives today, he will be there to help us. He doesn't spare us the problem, but he goes with us to guide us and to help us. Let's pray. Father, use these words to strengthen and to encourage us. Help us to center our trust, not only for salvation, but for everyday help in time of need upon the one who died for us and rose again. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want us to take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 694.